1,500 years ago, Northern Britain was home to many cultures, perhaps the most important being the Gaels and the Picts, two originally distinct peoples that came together to lay the foundations of modern-day Scotland. But who were they, and what finally united them? Hello, my name is Gwilym Morris Baird, and this is Celtic Source. We find evidence of people living in Northern Britain 14,000 years ago, and since then many different cultures have left their mark. So when talking about the beginnings of Scotland in the first millennium AD, we shouldn't overlook the fact that this is quite an arbitrary point at which to begin the story. The predecessors of the Kingdom of Scotland, both the Gaelic Kingdom of Dalrieda and the Kingdom of Pictland, were themselves part of a greater Celtic culture that can be traced back many thousands of years. But to choose an arbitrary point at which to begin, before the Romans turned up, as far as we can tell, Britain was inhabited by people who spoke P-Celtic, the Brythonic language that's later diverged into Welsh, Cornish and Breton, whereas the tribes in Ireland spoke Q-Celtic, the Goidilic language that later diverged into Irish, Manx and Scottish Gaelic. Then Romans arrived in Britain. Over the course of the next few hundred years, they violently subjugated most of the Brythonic tribes. In the lands they colonised, known today as England and Wales, they forcibly assimilated the population, giving the ruling class little choice but to adopt the Roman way of life. In 122 AD, the Romans built Hadrian's Wall from the River Tyne to the Solway Firth to mark the northernmost extent of the Roman Empire. All those beyond the wall were considered lawless barbarians. In the decades that followed, the Romans tried to push further north again, and in 142 AD, they built the Antonine Wall between the Firth of Forth and the Firth of Clyde. This new border wall lasted about eight years before being abandoned, and the Romans were never to regain control of the territory. This is important because it appears as though the Brythonic tribes that remained north of Hadrian's Wall, outside of the Roman Empire, were given the Latin name Picti, which means the painted people, perhaps due to the Celtic custom of painting or tattooing the body. By separating these northern tribes from their southern brethren, the Romans appear to have caused a split in the Brythonic cultures of Britain. This was essentially the situation until the Roman Empire began to collapse, causing them to abandon Britain in the 5th century AD. By this time, Brythonic had evolved into early Welsh, and the native ruling class, by that time deeply entwined with the Roman administration, had for the most part adopted the trappings of Roman culture. The Romans left in their wake a power vacuum. The subjugated Brythonic tribes were probably not as strong as they were before the Romans arrived, and this made Britain an attractive option for some of the Germanic tribes of mainland Europe, who, for various reasons, saw the opportunity to establish a new land for themselves. This is the period when the Angles, Jutes and Saxons, the ancestors of the English, began to arrive in large numbers and take control of the southern and eastern parts of Britain. It's also around this time that Irish kingdoms appear in Western Britain. These may have originally been small communities of Gaelic speakers that had lived alongside their Brythonic neighbours during the Roman occupation. But after the Romans left, one Gaelic kingdom in particular flourished, and that was Dalrieda. Dalrieda was probably an extension of a kingdom located on the northern coast of Ireland. According to early sources, a king by the name of Fergus the Great founded this new territory in the late 5th century, more than likely invading lands originally populated by Brythonic tribes, and either wiping them out or forcing them to migrate to the north and west. Fergus could have been a descendant of Irish kings, but in reality it's impossible to say if he was even a historical figure or merely a convenient myth used by later families wanting to claim royal descent. Regardless of how real Fergus was, Dalrieda grew over the coming centuries, expanding along the seaways of the northwestern coast of Britain. 
The kingdom soon became a significant power and maintained strong ties to Ireland and its aristocratic culture, in particular the Irish bardic tradition, as we'll discuss in the online course. Gaelic bards moved freely across the North Channel in service of both Irish and Dalriadan nobles. As it expanded, Dalriada came into conflict with the other people who inhabited northern Britain, including the early Welsh kingdoms south of the Firth of Clyde, the newly arrived Saxons of Bernicia, and of course the Picts. As is common throughout European history, as well as warring against each other, the ruling classes of Dalriada and the Picts also began to intermarry and have children. Nechton, for example, an 8th century king of the Picts, was actually of Gaelic descent. By this time, the ruling classes of the Picts and the Gaels were obviously converging. But several generations of intermarriage didn't ensure peace, far from it. Nechton's successor as king of the Picts, Oengus MacFergusa, attacked Dalriada several times during the 730s. By 741, he appears to have taken possession of the kingdom. It's unclear as to what happened to Dalriada after this, but there are signs the following century was no different, with alternating periods of peace and war between the Gaels and the Picts. But inevitably, perhaps, it appears as if the Gaels and the Picts were finally united in their fight against their common enemy, the Viking invaders. This may have been what motivated these two Celtic kingdoms to eventually merge in the 9th and 10th centuries. Traditionally, the 9th century king, Kenneth I, or Kinneath MacAlpin, appears to have been the first to hold the kingship of both Dalriada and Pictland without having to fight for it. Kenneth, originally a king of Dalriada, may well have simply inherited the kingship of the Picts. Over the centuries, Kenneth became the mythical first king of Scotland, although in reality it probably took several generations for the full union of the Gaels and the Picts to result in what became known as the Kingdom of Alba. By the 10th century, Alba covered most of northern Britain and its former language was Scottish Gaelic. It's likely that because successive generations of Pictish kings had been of Gaelic descent, that the Pictish language wasn't being spoken by the upper classes of the newly formed kingdom of Alba. Pictish eventually died out as a language sometime in the 11th century, and the only traces we have of it are found in the place names of Old Pictland. The Kingdom of Alba went on to become the Kingdom of Scotland during the medieval period and wasn't incorporated into the United Kingdom until the 18th century. The name Scotland is taken from the Latin name for the Gaels, Scotti. Scotia was the name given to the heartlands of the Kingdom of Alba and over time it was adopted as the name for the whole kingdom, eventually giving us Scotland. As I'm sure you will appreciate, this is a long and complex history and I've had to simplify and leave out a lot of detail. If there's anything you think I should have mentioned, please let me know in the comment section below. If you found this video interesting, please like and share and if you want to see more, subscribe and click the bell. You can download the different sources I've used to make this video from CelticSource.online. Just follow the link in the description below. Diolch am